Hello YouTube, welcome to the Hypertrophy Q&A number 8. I have a lot of questions to get to today, so we're going to get started. But first and foremost, if you have any questions that are related to hypertrophy, you can post them underneath this installment. If you post a question and I never get to it, it's because it was already asked. You can go back into the playlist of Q&As and seek it out because every single video is timestamped, so it's very easy to find. And on the topic of timestamps, if anyone is kind enough to do the timestamps for this video, I will put it in the description and pin your comment and your work is preemptively very appreciated. It saves me a lot of time and energy. So, very first question for the day. Bucci asks, what are your thoughts on finishers at the end of workouts? I never really gave them much thought, but I heard of Alpha Destiny talking about them recently and I'm thinking about incorporating them. So, finishers are good. Okay, there's nothing wrong with a finisher. That being said, it needs to remain a finisher, meaning that it cannot replace strength work and hard sets. It has to be something that completes them. And by definition, for you to be able to finish a muscle, it means that you already worked it throughout the session, which also means that it has to be an exercise that is going to target a muscle group that is already pre-fatigued. If it's not, you're not really doing a finisher. You might be doing nucleus overload or grease the groove, but it's not a finisher. Also, what finishers would you do at the end of your days of a gentleman's split? Which finisher movement for hip hinge, for example, versus horizontal press, etc. So, well, in line with what I just told you, basically, I would look at the day, the exercises I did, and the muscles that were targeted, and I would put, I would pick one exercise that is going to target one of these muscles. I personally rarely do more than two or three finishers per session, because I find that it's overkill, so I usually select uh, the ones that I really want to just completely exterminate on that day. A lot of the time it's like traps. A very easy way to do a finisher on traps is, Put some weight on the bar that you can shrug for like 15 reps and then do a decrease in weight. Pyramid down. I only pyramid down for finishers. Beyond that, I don't really like it. Uh, set by set, I like to keep my weight rigid and static. But for finishers, it's perfectly okay because, again, it's not supposed to be high quality tonnage. It's just supposed to be something you do at the end, even just for a pump or for a feeling. But again, these things don't replace muscle tension, so be careful. And in terms of which exercise, again, just use your imagination. Any exercise works. I wouldn't use compounds for finishers, obviously, meaning that I wouldn't use them with a stacked barbell, but you can replicate them with bands, for example. Like overhead press with a band is a good finisher for the shoulders. For a hip hinge, you can do something like hyper extensions with the body weight, etc., etc. Lefon Wastaken asks, Hey, hope you're doing well. I was just watching your videos on evolving rep ranges and I don't fully understand the concept. In your video, you give an example of a set of two reps, then 3-2, three, then 4-3-2, three, then 5-4-3. Three. My question is, are you doing AMRAP safely on the sets or you just try to get one more than last time? Okay, so first and foremost, I don't like the concept of AMRAP because an AMRAP cannot be done safely if it's a true AMRAP because you're trying to go until you cannot go anymore. And that also means that the higher intensity you do the AMRAP in, the more risky it is. Because in reality, an AMRAP with 60% is not risky at all. Even if you fell the last rep, you felt it with such low intensity and weight on the ball that it's not going to really put you at risk of serious injury. So an evolving rep range is not an AMRAP because an AMRAP, again, is up in the air. You don't know how many reps you're getting. You're getting as many reps as possible. It doesn't mean that AMRAPs are bad, but they cannot be implemented for your strength work or for your accessories and variations. I really don't like it. The only way I allow AMRAP to exist is for finishers or for calisthenics. Body weights, if it's not weighted calisthenics, you can do AMRAPs very safely. So, what are evolving rep ranges? An evolving rep range exists with the idea in mind that you already know how many reps you're supposed to be able to get and that the rep range represents that number. So if, for example, for the day I'm supposed to hit 3-2, I'm not guessing. I already know I'm supposed to get 3-2. And you might ask, okay, but how? Do you calculate? No, I don't calculate anything. I go from experience. 
Because with any lift you do, you're going to start conservative, whether you like it or not, you should always do that. And so you're going to ramp up and you're going to ramp up until at some point, the, the, the difficulties start to arise. Because if you start with an evolving rep rush on an exercise, you're going to see that it's very easy to do four, five, four, six, five, four, etc., 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 until you get to a point where it starts to slow. This is when you know that you've hit the ballpark and you are at the moment where the evolving rep range is going to have to prove its effectiveness because now the numbers that you use, the number of sets and reps, mean something. They're going to push you to the next level depending on the way you schedule them. So that is how you're supposed to use an evolving rep range. If you would want to do it the way I do it, I personally do reps in reserve. So it's evolving rep range minus one. I always go shy of that one last rep because someone like me can really grind on stuff like squats and deadlifts because I have a very strong lower back. But the question is, do I want to grind? The answer is no. So I just subtract a rep. Some people, they don't need to because they just are going to be perfectly aligned with the amount of reps they need to do to meet mechanical and muscular failure. For me, muscular failure occurs before mechanical failure. For a lot of people, it's the same. So that's, uh, that's a good way to use them. Also, are you trying to get all the sets with the equal amount of reps or is the first one the indicator of progression? Like you hit the upper end of the rep goal on the first set and then you increase the weight. Yes, I actually made a video about that in the playlist. So basically, the, the sets that are going to be following the number one top set of any evolving rep range that is going to be above one set is going to be volume. Because if you can do eight reps on a squat, yes, I know for a fact you can eat six and four, even within the same session. Actually, especially during the same session, you should prove to yourself that you have that type of muscular endurance. But the reason why you're going to do it is not for a PR, it's just for volume. You are accumulating high quality tonnage with the same weight. But the number one set is the indicator of progression. It's the one that dictates whether or not you're going to go up the rep range or up in weight. That is also based on the way you schedule. If the upper echelon of your rep range for the evolving rep range that we selected for a lift is six, when you can hit six, you're supposed to go up in weight. And then you have to select which rep range you're going down to. If you can hit six with 100 pounds, do you think you can hit three with 110? If the answer is yes, that's your evolving rep range. Okay, that depends on the way you scheduled it. Also, what are your thoughts on single progression for sets and reps? Like going from 2 to 6 to 4 to 6 and then increasing weight or reps. 3 to 6 to 3 to 8 and increase and repeat. I recently started single progression for reps and I'm increasing reps on a weekly basis. At least trying to, and in your video you said that it's difficult to replicate the same effort and do the same reps again for the next set. But because I take long rest periods, around 3-5 minutes per set, I'm able to do so and all my sets are grinders. Okay. So basically what you are describing here is that you are not really doing an evolving rep range or at least if it is evolving, it's going to be with the same weight and from what I get here, the, the, a, a different amount of sets. So the reps remain relatively similar because you do a two, from a 2 by 6 to a 4 by 6 so 2 sets of 6 to 4 sets of 6. My issue with this approach is the following. You are, yes, still getting very high quality tonnage, but the problem is that the intensity remains static and it can be tough to then jump up in weight because even though evolving rep ranges are skewed towards uh, tonnage accumulation and repetition of, of movements instead of a constant progression in weight on the bar, which is the, uh, the, the domain of static rep ranges, I still cannot take away the intensity aspect out because an evolving rep range that, that, is, uh, that is putting you in difficulty in terms of actually progressing in terms of weight will eventually result in lower tonnage overall. So I have to uh, actually meet that sweet middle. If, however, you enjoy that practice and you are still able to put weight on the bar, then go for it. It's not a problem at all. Citizen of Euphoria asks, 
Should novices always use full range of motion on exercises? Or are novices allowed to use partials in exercises where a secondary muscle group takes over towards the end of the lift and could fatigue before the target muscle group, like triceps during bench and overhead press, or biceps and forearms during the top of pull-ups? Well, first off, with a lot of novices, they do things because they were told to, but they don't understand why. I know that when you're just getting started, it's not really easy to know everything. You need time to actually get to it. But you should be curious and you should ask yourself these questions. And when people tell you, oh, just shut up and do this because I told you to, you should be suspicious of that person. Because why are they trying to keep you in the dark? They should actually tell you why you're doing things. So here, the answer is that I would personally say that novices should use the range of motion they're comfortable with always striving for more mobility and for more travel distance up until the point where their actual anthropometry disallows it. When you start squatting or deadlifting, for example, you're mostly going to be not very flexible at all, especially with the squats. It's stupid to tell a novice, oh, just go as to grass. No, they don't have that ability yet. Make them walk towards as to grass and then they can actually progress and use more weight on the bar. In terms of absolute muscle fiber damage, I would prefer that you use full range of motion. But understand also that you're not limited to it. I personally think that once you start entering the world of double progression and variations, it's perfectly fine to have one lift that is not technically full range of motion and one that is with less weight. Example, for my squat, when I squat heavy, I squat to parallel and up, that's it. But I still squat as to grass with my front squats and with my pose squats. Um, in terms of front squat, I do my warm-ups all the, all the way down. And for the pose squat, I do all of my reps as to grass 100%. That still gives me all of the benefits of full range of motion, plus also allows me to work in line of what I believe is best for me, for the squat, for example. So you are also allowed as a novice to experiment and use partials. But understand that partials also reduce the amount of muscle activation in terms of overall tonnage. And so this is the reason why a lot of people tell novices to just do full roam is that they're afraid that the novice is going to use partials and focus on them too much, which is something that happened. To be fair, I don't know if you guys remember a few years back, there was this entire craze about odd lifts. And you would see a bunch of guys like built like twigs who would do this much range of motion of like a Zurcher squat, or they would do behind the back deadlift with terrible fucking form, like off of blocks that are the size of my body. And the problem is that they thought it was working because they could lift a lot of weight, but I can tell you that these guys are still that small today because they never actually put down the base. You need a base, and the base is working towards full room. A partial is something you earn, in my opinion, but I will actually make a video about that. Swagger, Mac Jagger. Are five times a week bench programs good for building strength? Maybe. I don't talk about strength on this channel. What I can tell you is that if you bench five times a week, you better use variations and styles that are going to uh, alleviate the stress on the shoulders because that is a one-way ticket to Snap City. Bill Josh. What is a good static rep range to stay at for the compound movements before I add the evolving reps? How many work sets and back of sets? Would you recommend? So static rep ranges, I like 3x3 and 3x5. They're my favorites. 1x5 on the deadlift is also really good. 5x5, um, five five, I like less. I would say 5x5 five five for back of sets is not terrible. Although, understand, it's still a lot of tonnage. It's 25 total. So that would be for, uh, for the back of sets. And so you can stay with 3x3 three three and 3x5 until you graduate towards your evolving rep ranges. That's fine. Uh, for the work sets and back of sets, work sets are like one to three back of sets, two to three, usually. Would you use, would using something like RPE to drive progress with the static rep range before I switch to evolving rep range be useful, or would that reduce too much tonnage? Well, I personally don't use RPEs, but RPEs are just intensity manipulation, and yes, it is a valuable tactic and strategy. I use intensity, and as I told you, I don't calculate anything. In, unlike some people who use the intensity to calculate the rep range, I use the rep range to calculate intensity per se, because it's more experience based. But in your position, I would say that uh, you can very easily use RPEs. 
Uh, just don't fall into the mindset of training like a powerlifter because you're going to end up training for strength. Make sure that you always prioritize tonnage accumulation and uh, repetition of efforts instead of just peak strength. Ben and that. On my deadlift day yesterday, I was too tired to do my giant set at the end. Curls, calf, abs, forearms. So I did it just now, the day after. Stayed at baseline the whole time. AKA that he never really, he didn't really see a decrease in performance. I even did a fourth set, which explains why. I am pretty sure this would not have happened if I did it on deadlift day. So is this junk volume? Would it have been junk volume on deadlift day? Should I add more weight if I know I'm not going to be pre-fatigued? Okay. So first off, is this, is this junk volume? Not necessarily, but the fact that you did not see a decrease in baseline strength shows that what you did didn't really fatigue the muscle as much as you think. Example, if you do a set of hammer curls and you can do 10 and you take a three minute rep, uh, rest and you can do 10 again, this shows two things. Either the weight is too easy for you, meaning that you could have either done more than 10 reps or you are at the point where you should have went up in weight because you are way too capable of repeating the, 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 the uh, muscular endurance um, show without really seeing any difference. And you did that for fourth set, so that's, so that's definitely a thing. You could have done more. You could have fatigued the muscle more. Would it would have been jungle volume deadlift day? That is a good question. See here, it's the, it's the entire question around like intensity. Intensity is correlated with fatigue and pressure exerted beforehand. Let's say you do 10 reps of squats and you do it with 225 and you open the workout with that and it's super easy. That might be junk volume. Now, let's say you do the exact same set at the end of a killer leg workout where you did squats, Romanian deadlifts and front squats. Now, this set is really difficult, might not be the best in terms of volume. You might already be pretty much done when it comes to the amount of volume you can do for the legs on that day, but it's still much higher in intensity than if you had done it without any work. So no, maybe on the deadlift day, that exact same exercise you did would have been high quality tonnage. Although I think that in this case, and that's just me thinking out loud, you psyched yourself out because you are tired in terms of cardiovascular and nervous system and etc. cetera in your, in your head also from the deadlift, which are extremely tiring, both mentally and psychologically. And so you talked yourself out of doing anything else. But keep in mind that the deadlift doesn't really work the biceps or the calves or the forearms really, unless, unless you just grab it double overhand. And so you had the muscle endurance to do it, but the state of fatigue you were in prevented you from actually giving it a try. So let's next time I would say, if you have scheduled a circuit or a giant set, just do it. Don't tell yourself I'm fatigued. Yeah, you did deadlift, cool. That set following that doesn't target the muscles that the deadlift targets. You have no excuse, you're supposed to do it. Should I, should I add more weight if I know I'm not going to be pre-fatigued? Yes, if you're going to do it again next time, for example, and you do it the second day, Add more weight, because clearly you had the ability to. Anisimus. I have tons of scarred cartilage in my knees and elbows from getting hit by a car. So any overhead tricep work never feels comfortable no matter what I do. However, tricep pushdowns for good. Between that isolation and my compounds that involve the triceps, will this be enough for great tricep gains? I assume it is, but I wanted to hear your opinion. Thank you. Yes. For me, I really like tricep extensions with a band, just like for nucleus overload, for example, but you don't need to do it all, right? One type of push down is great. I would still tell you to do a type of uh, long head of the tricep movement. That's very important, but heavy presses and one type of extension that you do regularly throughout the week is good. You're going to progress and, it feels, and if it feels good on the elbows, even better. The Educated Barbarian. Opinions on hack squats for hypertrophy as well as Zurcher squats and deads. I think they look very cool, but I don't know about using them for variations. Hack squats are good. It's, it's a lot of range of motion. It's less uh, lower back strain. If you have a hack squat machine in your gym, I would say use it. You could even, and I know it's going to make some people scream, replace back squats by hack squat completely. Uh, the only problem I have with this is that it's tough, as, as you said, to find lines of variations with the hack squat. And also, it's something that you need to get used to because you can still hurt yourself on the hack squat, so be very careful. But if you have a really good hack squat machine and you don't really particularly enjoy back squats, 
hack squats and then some type of lunge, reverse lunges for the quads is going to be good. You're going to get really big legs from that. Zurcher squats and deads. Um, the Zurchers took YouTube by storm a few years back and a lot of people really like them. For a reason, it's because they're a cool lift. Like it's, it's, it's fun to do on top of that. It's painful, but fun. Zurcher squats to me could be used as a very good variation, but I wouldn't necessarily use them as your main style unless you're some sort of athlete, especially some type of wrestler, because I have found that they function sort of like um, front squats in a sense. So again, if someone asks me, can I use front squats for my quad? I would say, well, if you're an Olympic weightlifter, yes. And uh, if you're not, unless you really love front squats or zurchers, then don't. But keep in mind that even a zurcher has variations. You can do pose zurchers. You can do, uh, what can you do? You can do pin zurchers. There are ways to work around it. So if you love them, do them. Same for the deadlifts. Zurcher deadlifts, you love them? Okay. Just keep in mind that they demand a lot of lower back rigidity. And I would say that novices are just not built for that. Same for the zurcher squats. The problem is that they require a ton of core strength and most people have none of that. So build yourself up. I don't want you to do Zurcher good morning, thinking you're doing squats. Keep in mind, it's still technically a knee flexion. Latissimus 65. If the priority for an experienced lifter is mostly legs and delts, would you increase leg frequency from the standard twice every seven days to maybe twice every six days? Favorite split skeletons in this scenario? Yes, I would, absolutely. Uh, I personally train legs three times a week. Every two days I hit legs, and I hit legs heavy, right? Now, I don't deadlift heavy every two days, or squat heavy every two days, but I do a heavy movement, hip hinge, or knee flexion every two days. You want big legs? That's the way to go. You could even walk them th uh, four times a week if you wanted. And delts. The delts, I would say, have a different approach, maybe. Maybe have a, a heavy... have. Um, maybe three to four heavy presses in the week. So maybe two heavy vertical presses, two heavy horizontal presses. And if you really, really want big shoulders, three vertical presses and one horizontal press. And then sprinkle in some type of lower uh, weight, higher rep range, lateral raise and real delt work to get those, those uh, delts to really grow. So also you could work your delts four times a week. Um, so maybe even five times a week, actually. You, you just have to pay attention to the half of the shoulder. It's really important. So maybe three heavy presses, press days and two lighter days where you're going to take the, the lateral raises and superset them on a different day. Maybe even on a lower body day if you know how to handle your recovery. Or two heavy press days and three lateral raises or three heavy press days and, uh, and three lateral raises where one of the lateral raises goes on the press day. That's possible. In terms of fifth split skeleton for this, I would say push pull leg is not going to cut it. Full body uh, can cut it, but the problem is that with full body, you're going to have to schedule the days around the, the heavy leg movement, so it's going to be complicated. I think the upper lower is your best uh, is your best choice for this because you can do three lower a week, and that's going to be legs. Three upper a week, so that's going to be shoulder, 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 in a sense. And uh, you can do your lateral raises on the lower day. Tariko 16. I have a question for NH and the community. How much do you add to your deadlift and squat max every week as new powerlifter? Well, I don't know about that. I'm not a powerlifter. And if people are powerlifting on this channel, it's good for you. But that's, that's not what we do here. I will also tell you to be careful with that uh, mindset of comparing yourself with others. There's absolutely no point. You're just going to end up either disgusting yourself from the practice of powerlifting or you're going to have low standards because you're going to be better than others and it's going to kill your drive. Roland Kuman. Hey NH, I've heard you mention a weird soreness between your chest and your shoulders after benching. I've had this exact same issue for a couple of months now and can't seem to get rid of it. I haven't benched properly in several months. I've reduced the weight by a lot and replaced a lot of the volume of push-ups. I also do shoulder health exercises. Any more tips for this issue in particular? Yes. For me, what did it was a slingshot. Meaning that I didn't stop benching. I just benched with a slingshot for a long time. And then I started doing variations that reduce the strain on the shoulder, like pose, pose, pose bench, spoto bench, close grip bench. And you know what? I still do that. 
I never went back to heavy touch and go bench just because I hurt my shoulders too many times and I was like, it's not worth it. I'm not getting anything out of it. So let me just switch. For you, I see something interesting in your message. You're telling me that you did push-ups. Do push-ups feel good? You felt the pain with push-ups? And if the answer is no, maybe you should just go to push-ups and do weighted push-ups instead. That pain is a bitch. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that it just takes a long time. And it's the type of pain too that the more you think about it and obsess about it and you touch it and you do that, that lifters do all the time, or you like massage it, quote unquote, the more it's going to stick around because you're feeding it. So I would say continue on your path. You seem to be doing things proper. Keep going. I guarantee you the pain is going to go away. 56A. Sup and H. I have duck feet and very long legs. So it's hard for me to squat with proper form. And I think it's holding me back because no program is good without decent squatting. I'm trying to do some ankle flexibility exercises, but I'm not sure what other accessory exercises I could do to fix this and whether or not I should do them every day. No. Any help would be appreciated. Thanks again. No, don't squat every day. Certainly not. What you can do is, first off, understand that you're not built like everyone else and you cannot squat like everyone else. High bar for you is most likely out of the equation. Uh, you might have to do lower bar. Like a lot of guys with long legs, and a lot of guys who don't, uh, who have a tough time uh, rotating their feet outwards, in a sense. Because in your position, I, su I suppose that you experience a ton of knee valgus. So I want you to do goblet squats first and foremost, trying to see how much you can push the knees in front of you. Because you might find that there is a comfort zone that is going to fall the best. People with long legs, a lot of the time they try to cheat the system and game the system and they try to really push their knees out as much as they can because they don't want to travel forward and they don't realize that this is what causes them lower back injuries in the squat. You need to allow the knees to travel forward in the squat up to a certain extent and goblet squat is going to be a safe way to do that and build the capacity in the quads to actually squat proper. Don't do that every day, I would say two or three times a week. And then play around. Before you, before or after your goblet squat, grab a bar and play around. Do low bar, modify your stance, see the range of motion you can do and if it doesn't work, do something else. You might not be made for squats do lunges, reverse lunges, and maybe even goblet squats. You can build good legs with that. You have long legs, it's going to take a long time. BET. How do you avoid heat stroke during the summer? My workouts in summer suffer from dying due to heat exhaustion. I think it depends on who you are. Some people are really comfortable with high heat. Some people are not. I am personally really, really comfortable with it. I can work out in a 100 degree environment with high humidity and I'm fine as long as I drink water in between sets. If you don't do that, I would say, please do it. Just gulp water in between your sets. Don't think that drinking a ton before and after the workout is enough. You need to rearrange yourself as you go. If it doesn't work, you need to find a way to cool yourself off. Get a fan, get a shitty fan and blast it in your face as you train. You might not think it will do much, but it's going to greatly reduce your core temperature. And uh, that was that is pretty much what I'm telling you to do. You need also to walk up to that temperature. It, of course, if you plug yourself in a situation where it's really hot all the time, you're going to suffer from it. You need to train the body. So train the body in situations where it's not under stress and under load with weight and just like suck it up. Like you go to bed, it's warm. Okay, take a cold shower before bed, go to bed, cut the AC, cut the fan and sleep like this. Your body needs to be put in that situation. I know a lot of people who spend their days in AC and they go outside and they wonder why they feel like shit. It's because your body is always in 68 degrees temperature with perfect control humidity. Then you go out to the real world and your body is like, what is going on? What is this? Hell, I don't feel good. Yeah, of course you don't feel good. It's because you're just not ready for it at all. Also make sure that you consume, consume salt. Sodium is very important for uh, water retention, but also for the ability of the body to actually produce electrolytes. Because water by itself doesn't cut it. It doesn't hydrate you if you can't absorb it. Big Smoke. Thoughts on mTOR reset and taking breaks to resensitize the muscle. Team 3D Alpha and Mike Isolta always talk about this, so I had to ask. My opinion is this is bullshit. 
And the reason why is that this is a powerlifting principle. And a ton of the things that are being pushed to bodybuilders and to people who are trying to gain uh, muscle on this platform come straight from powerlifting, so much so that I'm always sort of smiling at it because I'm thinking, well, is no one seeing what I'm seeing? You just took a powerlifting principle, you packaged it under the name bodybuilding, and you're trying to pass it off as uh, actually effective, and it's simply not. I'll make a full video about it because there's a laundry list of things that people do that just don't work for bodybuilding and are malpractices. They work for powerlifting, all right, but not for bodybuilding. This is one of them. You are not supposed to take breaks to resensitize the muscle. The muscle is never desensitized. It makes no sense. The muscle is constantly fighting for its life. There is no point in your life where the muscle is going to think to itself, okay, I, I'm going to stop repairing muscle fibers. Like this is the day where nothing you do will make me trigger protein synthesis. That's not possible. That would be like if your body just killed your, kill, killed your consciousness and your brain in your sleep. It makes no sense. What is, however, true is that if you constantly go uh, balls to the walls all the time, you're going to, at some point, reach, reach a certain degree of fatigue that you cannot recover from, and that is when you need to take a step back. But evolving rep ranges exist for that. Rotations exist for that. We already have mechanisms in place. There is no point in just stopping altogether. Absolute wonker. Benefits of sauna for muscle growth and health. For muscle growth, I don't know. For health, I have heard that it's actually quite beneficial. But see, to me, it's beneficial for one reason. It's because it puts your body in an extreme condition and it forces it to adapt. It's like extreme cold. Extreme cold, like cold showers, are also good for health. Because they, they put the body again in an uncomfortable position. And discomfort is good for health, usually. You don't want to push it and become uh, masochistic in a sense, but uh, sauna can be great. Just pay attention to your heart, because it can be a little bit strenuous on the heart. But it's good. If you enjoy it, do it. Ephaestus. Why the nuances behind your berserker physique, neglecting the frontal upper chest? Uh, well, it's very simple. It's preferences. Actually, I'm thinking of making a video about this next Wednesday, about body goals. But my, my point is this. You train for yourself and you train to look the way you want to look, so you should do that. For me, I trained a long time, I wasn't really sure what I was aiming for, and then right there I realized what I wanted. I also realized that it wasn't aligned with what most people wanted, but guess what? I don't care. I'm the one in this body. I wake up in this body and I walk around with it, so I'll do whatever I want. And for me, the reason why I don't like big shoulders is because I don't want them to overpower the rest of the arms. To me, there's nothing worse of a look than having a big shoulder and then an arm that looks like a tube because of it. And the problem is that a lot of pro bodybuilders look like that, and it's something I want to avoid at all costs. I want this here to be bigger than this. This needs to be capped. It doesn't need to be big. Actually, I'm at a point now where I'm thinking that the shoulders are getting too big. So I'm doing my best to reduce the tonnage. And for some people, they don't get it because they try to get everything big that mindset works when you're a novice because you, everything can just grow, you don't care. But when you're at my level, when you're a bit more advanced, you start to find that there are choices to make and that for your aesthetic goal to be realized, there needs to be sacrifices in certain areas. So that's what I sacrifice. I personally couldn't give less of a fuck about the upper chest. I don't find it attractive or aesthetic at all. So I also don't focus on it. And uh, on other areas, for example, the legs, I go overboard. Some people would say, well, that makes no sense. Why do you want big legs? Well, I could, I could twist that on you and tell you why do you want big shoulders and not big legs. I like big legs more than I like big shoulders, so I train for big legs. It's simple. And I'm sure that within your heart, there is a goal physique that maybe doesn't align with the mainstream. And I tell you, fulfill it and actually follow it. Don't listen to people. How to make sure tendonitis doesn't become permanent tendon damage? That's for the injury Q&A, but the, the answer is very simple. You just don't do anything stupid. I've had tendonitis that evolved into tendon damage, although not permanent, and it was because I tried to lift too much weight. I refused to listen to the pain that my body was sending me, and instead of rehabbing the tendon, I just, I just did something dumb and I lifted too much and it snapped. Rob K is 30 down push-ups and 30 down pull-ups a good workout for hypertrophy. 
Alpha Destiny says it's a good method for building muscles, but I know your opinion on junk volume. I know it's not perfect, but can it be effective? Yeah, it can be effective, but you could also get the exact same results with less reps, less sets, and just weight. Instead of doing tons of push-ups, do more difficult variations and or do weighted push-ups. Same for the pull-ups. Because this would take you forever. Unless you just superset it all the time. It could be a good workout, I guess, for an off day. But as your main mean of hypertrophy, you can get more or the similar results even with much less time put in. So why not do it? Because the issue is this. If you apply this type of mindset and you think, well, it still works, okay, cool, but now you're going to end up spending 30 hours in the gym instead of 15, and we only have so much time on this earth, so you want to optimize and maximize as much as possible. It can be effective, however, for sure. And if you're the type of person that likes to just lose yourself in the training and calisthenics, well, do that. So for some people, they would much rather do push-ups for an hour than doing three sets of heavy bench, because they like the push-ups better. In that case, do your push-ups. Blade strike. Will doing ammo curls result in wider looking biceps when viewed from the front arms by the side? Some claim that the development of the brachialis will push the other heads by the side, resulting in a wider look. Or is it just the case of having to build more mass regardless of the curling movement or, or head focus? Yes and yes, in a sense. Meaning that it is true that when the brachialis grows, it also makes the entire arm bigger, regardless of how much size you gain there, because it is simply, as you said, reorganizing the way the arm looks. A good example is the lat. Grow your lat and pose. The lat ends up pushing against the shoulder and the long head of the triceps, so it makes them look bigger, even if these muscles stay the same size. It's the same here. And yes, if you look at the bicep from the side, this guy here has a tendency to grow like this. So towards the camera in this situation here. But to the side, it creates more of a, a, a 3D effect and a relief. So if it's something you want, you want wider biceps, then you absolutely should work the side of the arm because that's what's going to make it look more bulky. And it doesn't cost anything to do six sets of ammo curls a week anyways. Joshish. Do you think it's a good idea to program two squat variations and a deadlift variation on the same day and vice versa? Something like squat, snatch, uh, pose, box squat, or deadlift, front squat, American, Roman deadlifts. It is doable, although I would say that for most people who are getting started, quote unquote, with their leg training, it's not necessary. Meaning that you would get better results doing one knee flexion and one hip hinge as a variation than the three. For people more advanced, it is possible. Although, squat followed by snatch deadlifts is not a good idea. Meaning that I would prefer you open with the snatch and then did a type of knee flexion like a post squat. Uh, in this situation, my, uh, my understanding is the following. You're going to have more of a tendency to get injured in situations of lower body movement if you open with the squat. This is the reason why I also really don't like it when people do straight up squat and deadlift on the same day. And the issue is that the other way around is also true because the squat also demands a lot of rigidity in the lower back. So if you deadlift and you squat, it is also is sometimes a problem. So if we compare that to your second example, where you do deadlifts than front squat, now it's entirely different because the front squat has much less demand on the lumbar spine. So as for the day two, it is good, even though you still do an RDL afterwards because the RDL is in a higher rep range and you're going to be able to actually really control the range of motion. Whereas the number one day also has you do pose and box squats as the third iteration of the lower body movements, which also require a lot of lumbar extension. So the number one day, in my opinion, is not a good day, meaning that I would much rather have you enter a rotation between pose or box squats and then do snatch and dead or the other way around if it's more comfortable for you and just strip the squats entirely from the equation. Do your heavy squats on a different day, your straight up normal squats and then do something like an hyperextension or like lunges or like glute arm raises that put, put less strain on the lower back. It's all about managing fatigue and pressure and getting enough work towards the legs so that they grow.
And for tips on getting started with the front squats, uh, well, if you're willing to enter that journey, understand it's going to take a long, long time. Uh, I would say look up uh, uh, Olympic weightlifter videos. They are the masters of front squats. For me, it took me like, I don't know, two years to get comfortable with them. I did them because I love them. It might take you just as much. You need to start doing them. Find the rack position you like, how many fingers, etc., etc. Hmm. I'm so going to answer this. What are some main factors in body structure and programming leading to the fridge physique? How can one look for signs of the fridge physique development and prevent it? That's Aris asking this question. I made a video about that uh, called uh, avoiding spider mode, if I recall correctly. In uh, summary, the fridge physique is caused by one thing. It is an overfocus on the development of the torso to the detriment of the arms and sometimes the legs, meaning that this grows too much and this not enough, which gives the impression of you just having like a, a fridge physique because you end up being square. The way to avoid that is don't fall for the powerlifting meme of only doing bench squat and deadlift and chin ups for biceps and actually isolate your muscles and don't bulk too much. How to get a big serratus anterior. Serratus is a muscle I never really thought about. I mean that I never really thought to myself, okay, I'm programming serratus. And across the board, when I program, I never really think that much about certain muscles. I might make a video about these muscles that are like the forgotten muscles because, in my opinion, they just get worked. You know how some people again say that you just do chin ups and the bicep work? Well, it's true, but it's not enough. And yet, you have certain muscles that, if you do something else, they'll just get worked regardless. So for some people, they'll tell you that pullovers are good for serratus. Why not? Pullovers are amazing to start with, so do them. You can do Russian twists. Any type of core training and bracing will also work the serratus. Um, something that I do for it too is, and I never really realized I was doing it, but for my rib rehab, I do something where I do a serratus punch to stretch the rib, and I have found that it gave me some definition in the area, so you can try that as well. Bernard, Bernard, I don't know how to pronounce that in English, Bernard, we say in French, Santos, I disagree with your take on measuring muscle growth. Shouldn't the primary method of measuring muscle growth be the ability to fully complete sets slash reps that you had previously failed? For example, you are pressing 140 pounds on the overhead press for 3 by 5 the first set is a clean 5 reps, it's hard, you made it, then on sets 2 and 3 you don't manage to hit 5. In my mind, the best thing to do is to scale back by 10% and build back each session by adding 5 pounds via microplates. Uh, this is not my original idea. I got it from the last natural. I think it's really worked out very well. It helped me a lot with my plateaus. It's possible that maybe it's only worked because I implemented the strategy around the same time. I actually took over it press seriously. In my mind, the ability to do a full 3 by 5 is the indicator of growth. Let me know your thoughts. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. This is a really uh, rud rudimentary and primitive way of approaching muscle growth. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that you would even present that as a valid argument because there's a big issue with what you're presenting. Basically, what I talk about muscle growth, my argument was this. The best way to measure muscle growth is to look at the baseline, right? If you damaged the baseline, then you're going to grow. In your example, you did that, meaning that you did five reps and then you couldn't get five reps anymore. Guess what? It means that you damaged the baseline. So the number one top set had very high quality tonnage, so much so that it damaged your ability to do it again, you couldn't do it again, so you failed to do that. Your answer and reaction to that was to just say, oh no, I want to hit five reps at all cost, let me scale back. So you killed the high quality tonnage you were getting because you were trying to grow muscle and you did the exact opposite instead. Maybe it helped you uh, kill a plateau, I'm not saying the opposite, but in terms of pure tonnage and muscle growth, you damaged your ability to actually get that, to get to that level. Because you were eventually going to get to the point where you could have done 3x5. In a sense, your 3x5, and that's true for anyone who does 3x5 and 5x5, at some point you are being pushed and forced into what is called 
an evolving rep range because you end up finding out that it's impossible for you to get five reps for three sets because the weight is too high. And instead of thinking, okay, maybe it's not bad. Maybe it's actually good that I'm for once not able to get those three sets because it shows that this is damaging the baseline. No, no. People say, oh, terrible. Let me take less weight and get my five reps. Well, cool. Now you get less weight on the bar and maybe you get more reps, but the intensity of these reps is much reduced. You should have just embraced the evolving rep range. Okay, you did three sets, five, four, three. Hey, guess what? This might be a good evolving rep range. Meaning that you would tell yourself that this could be a start of an evolving rep range. And if you can hit five, 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 you go up to go down to five, four, three with more weight. That would actually be smart instead of just sticking to a three by five. So I don't know about the last natural, but uh, I'm going to guess that he's not super big. Because when you use that and you're constantly focused on that PR and weight on the bar, you lose sight of tonnage. And when you lose sight of tonnage, you don't grow anymore. So yeah, if, if, if I didn't get your question, because I'm a little bit surprised at your argument to start with, uh, rephrase it and I'll get back to it. Abdo Al Muhammad, what do you think of rotating percentages? So not only stuck with 5x5 five five or 5x3, five I mean, having the day split into three giant set blocks of main lift, variation accessories, so you have a lot of rep ranges. Well, that's what I do. I vary rep ranges in all of my programs. So the answer is yes, it's good. And then you say, so you don't have only, only light day or heavy days. I personally say that, again, I disagree with that practice. You want all of your days to be a mix of light and heavy. So yes, it's good. Keep doing that. MPP999. Do you think bell squats have carry over to squats? Low bar to be specific. I'm thinking about alternating the two and doing volume work and form work on belt squat to increase my sub-25 poverty squat. I also want to correct the hip shift, which activates under greater loads. Yes, they do have a carryover uh, overall because it's an inflection, but keep in mind that you have a very vertical torso when you do your belt squats. And so uh, it has a better carryover to the high bar squats. It still carries over to the low bar squats. Plus it has low impact on the lower back. So knock yourself out. Uh, I think that the discovery of the belt squat is going to lead to bigger legs overall because a um, lot more people are going to be able to get a lot of reps done of purely quote-unquote quad isolation with that. So again, knock yourself out. Arus W. Have you had good training experiences with some of the less common machines in a gym like the Reverse Hyper? Which would you recommend giving a try? I wasn't a big machine guy at all. Uh, the ones that I preferred were the cable row for the isolation of the upper back. I liked, uh, what did I like too? Pretty, that's pretty much all I liked. I liked the, pu the pulley for the triceps. I say just try them. If you like them, just do them. A lot of uh, machines are actually really good. It's just that, uh, in my opinion, for a lot of people, they cannot replace straight weight. <coughs> this one... I already answered. I might actually answer it again. So Abdul or Muhammad asks, you're saying that novices shouldn't stay on the same program for too long, but you advised before that novices shouldn't change programs too often and basically stay on the same program till it stops progressing. Also, you're saying here you shouldn't stay a novice for too long, like six months top. But before you said you shouldn't rush being a novice and can stay a novice for two years even. Am I misunderstanding something? You didn't misunderstand my, misunderstand my words, you misunderstand the meaning of my words. So what I meant by that you shouldn't be a novice for too long, I meant that you shouldn't be a dependent on someone else's program for too long. Within six months, I want you to start becoming curious and take a look. I find abhorrent that some people stay within lifting for five years and they never think about making their own program. They're constantly taking someone else's program. After six months, you should start looking at things and making your own. But in terms of what YouTube Fitness dictates and has decided is a standard, I say screw that and stay within the shallow waters of the novice range for strength 
as much as you want. You don't need to be rushed. Two years is perfectly fine. You will find that you're going to end up bigger than all of these guys rushed into intermediate because you will actually have accumulated tonnage and you're going to outlast them as well. I described that in the novice syndrome video. And yes, novices shouldn't change programs too often. And you should milk the program as much as you can because switching programs is a, a symptom of novice syndrome. It's also the best way to stay a novice forever. And the difference is this. A novice shouldn't stay on the same program for too long because eventually they're going to make their own. It doesn't mean that they are going to jump on someone else's. Okay, that is for a different Q&A. And I think that's it. We are done for the day, guys. Uh, maybe this one by Sir Mauk. Why don't you do any strength work for your upper back like a weighted chin-up pull-up? I'm considering doing weighted chin-ups as strength work for the upper back, but I want your opinion. So I don't do any strength work for the upper back because a lot of the time, the exercises that people select are not really upper back movements. Like doing a heavy row is a, a hybrid. So you do a, a hip hinge and an upper back thing. Chin-ups and pull-ups are valid upper back strength works. The problem is that for me, I cannot do straight up weighted chin-ups because I have a wooden platform and it's too precious. I don't want to risk a plate falling on it. So I do grease the groove method with ankle weights instead. So they're still weighted, but it's baby weight. It's still at the end of the day amount to a ton of high quality tonnage. Um, and also, I think it's the, the entire idea surrounding a split that would open with strength work for the upper back that I find concerning. Because you can do it as a row for a hip hinge, which then the rest of the day is a lower body day. But if you do like a seal row, for example, it puts into question the rest of the day. What do you do next? Because keep in mind that the strength work is going to be the center of the entire day. It dictates the way the day is going to be scheduled and what muscles are worked on it. I have found that upper back, because of its ability to handle a lot of volume, is always better as a, not an afterthought, but a secondary thought. Because it fits perfectly on every single day. You can train upper back every single day. And it's better this way, because now you can put rows and pullovers everywhere you want instead of having to hyper-focus on that one day that has the heavy strength work. So it's the reason why I do it this way. And I'm actually going to leave you with that. Again, if your question was not answered, it's either because I already answered it in the past, or it fits better in a different Q&A. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Have a good day.